it's a pretty active scene here. Crews continue to go through the entrance of Catalina State Park to get both boots and engines on the mountain. If we are in the thick of it, in the middle of the protest, it started originally at Dunbar Pavilion. Nos estaba diciendo Héctor que también tienen cuenta bancaria separada para separar lo personal del negocio. And of course, as Hector mentioned, they also have that separate account. Traffic in this area was awful. We're talking cars backed up for miles on both sides. Now a completely different scene. You have your average evening commute, except for when you get to the end of the off ramp. You start seeing those cars starting to slow down when they see officers. Folks are telling us that this storm is unlike anything they've ever seen from down power lines to this. An uprooted saguaro that plowed through this fence due to the magnitude of the storm. Everyone's dressed for the occasion. I'm in my plaid. I have my boots on. Horses are right behind me. Fitting right for the 95th annual Tucson Rodeo. A very smoky scene. Ashes flying all over the place and here's why. That big horn fire continuing to burn and you can see the fire line that smoke coming up. We don't know their gender, their age, or even where they traveled from. What we do know, they were tested mid last week. And of course, today, that announcement of the first presumptive positive case of coronavirus here in Pima County. U of A's homecoming is here. We get a look at the iconic bonfire event and the excitement from students. Normally, people would be coming to the Fox Theater to watch short films. But now the film festival has gone virtual. Here's how some students have adapted to the change. Though they don't have any more hand sanitizer or masks, they do have disinfecting wipes that not only kill 99.9% of viruses and bacteria, but also help protect you from the coronavirus. And even though Evo is retired now, he can still do bite work on command. It has been closed indefinitely for the health and safety of visitors and staff. That goes for trash services as well. They have been suspended, but that doesn't stop some from taking it upon themselves to pick up the trash and leave this beautiful mountain cleaner than how they found it. KGA 9 News at 10. It's Child Abuse Prevention Month, the approach city leaders are taking to help kids in need. But first, a memorial for nearly 20 Marines who lost their lives in a training mission. Good evening, I'm Lustelia Caballero. Thank you so much for joining us. Taja Davis has the night off. More than two decades after 19 Marines lost their lives, dozens gathered at the site of the crash in Marana to remember them. The Tucson Folk Festival returned today, kicking off a free weekend of music. Three stages were set up across Tucson with socially distanced crowds and the ability to view the acts from attendees' cars. Hey folks, hope you're staying cool out there, drinking plenty of water, and if you're outside, applying sunscreen and wearing clothes to protect your skin because it is dangerously warm outside, 105 degrees. It pains me to say that. What you're seeing are alto cumulus clouds. That's this right here. Those are super cooled water droplets. Now, when you mix those with ice crystals, those droplets quickly freeze and fall. That forms a cirrus cloud, which is what you're seeing here. And we're gonna be doing a little dance with Mother Nature, at least for the next couple of hours. The dangerous part here, although it is a tropical storm. It's moving very slowly, so it's mimicking the pattern of Sally. It made landfall as a Category 2 downgraded to a tropical storm, but it caused historic and catastrophic flooding. So tropical storm beta has that same potential because it's moving very slowly. Red is the color of missing murdered indigenous persons because when a soul is lost in many cultures, it is the only color they can see. According to a study funded by the National Institute of Justice, in some U.S. counties, Native women are 10 times more likely to be murdered than the national average. This is the reality of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. The following pictures come from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Jane Doe, 2002, body found in October. She's between the age of 16 and 22, Hispanic, found inside the Tono Otom Nation. Jane Doe, 2007, discovered in July, between the age of 13 to 17, Hispanic, also found inside the Tono Otom Nation. Jane Doe, 2009, body found in October, between the age of 16 to 21, Hispanic, found inside the Tono Otom Nation. The numbers are shocking. However, it's not something that's going to be new to Indian country. Kagan 9 went to the Pasquayaki Tribal Courthouse in October. Alfred Urbina, an associate judge with the Pasquayaki Tribe, explains why thousands of girls are going missing, being murdered in Arizona. There are things that are unique to Arizona that we can look to, specifically 
the border, human trafficking, sex trafficking, the common domestic violence case. Another study funded by the National Institute of Justice shows in the U.S., four in five indigenous women experience violence in their lifetime, including sexual assault and domestic and family violence. That's a higher rate compared to women of other ethnicities. When you're more afraid of something that's in your house versus running out into the darkness, that's the reality that a lot of these women and, and children find themselves in. The CDC found in 2017 homicide was the fourth leading cause of death for Native American girls between the ages of 1 to 19 and the sixth leading cause of death for the 20 to 44 age group. Urbina says substance abuse, lack of housing, and even unemployment can contribute to abuse toward indigenous women and girls. We do know that there is a fetish market for Native women in human trafficking. But Arizona State Representative Jennifer Germain says this crisis can be solved. We don't want people to fall through the cracks when they cross a jurisdictional line. We know that that is where cases are going cold. In 2019, Representative Germain helped create the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls Task Force. There are 22 members of the task force, and we built a cross-jurisdictional committee that includes state leaders, federal leaders, tribal leaders, our healthcare workers, and our social workers. Urbina also sits on the task force, currently working on Indian country as a former prosecutor and former police officer. The charge for the task force was to find out, is this happening? How often is it happening? Why is it happening? So where is the system failing? People will often be misclassified as Hispanic when in fact they're indigenous and they're a member of a tribe, whether it's Basquiaki, Tanatham, Navajo. The missing cases is extremely hard to quantify because they don't exist in law enforcement databases. It's not a crime for an adult to go missing. You don't see TV specials about what happened, whether or not the person was found. So in a sense, they are invisible um, to everybody but their family. Culturally, when matriarchs go missing, it is extremely disruptive. In some cultures, it's a break in the family lineage in the clan system. A lot of times you see the children go into the foster care or the ICWA system. If your family member has gone missing or has been murdered, this is what you can do. File an incident report with your local law enforcement agency. Number two, upload your loved one's information into the National Missing Persons Database, which is the NamUs. Now's the time for families to start reaching out, go back and ask more questions. Don't let anybody drop the ball. Members of the task force say this is just the beginning. There's more to be done, and they plan on bringing change and awareness through continued research. Lustelia Caballero, Kagan 9, on your side. That meeting was set to start at 7 p.m., and clearly that did not happen. Instead, the sheriff's department worked to clear that building for more than an hour. You took an oath to defend the Constitution. Those are our children that are dying. Please do what's right. Let our voices be heard. At around 710, you hear parents demanding their voices and the voices of their kids be heard. I'm probably going to keep yelling at you because I want you them to hear. But let's go back to around 6 o'clock. Parents and self-proclaimed freedom fighters protesting peacefully with signs, asking for masks to at least be optional. From what I've seen, these parents aren't going to take no for an answer, and I don't blame them. I believe state law is on their side. Parents have the right to make the choice. That is the statute. ARS 1-601 is parental rights to control what their children are doing. Totally against it. I think they need to have the option. I think it's a parent's right, uh, not the school district, not the government, not anybody else but the parents to have the say over the children and what they do and their bodies and their health. We also spoke to a parent who supports mask usage inside school grounds. By maintaining masks, it makes sure we don't have an outbreak. We already have a shortage of teachers in Arizona as a whole. So we keeping our teachers safe and still getting our kids back in school. And while parents and students gathered outside of the Vail Education Center with signs waiting for the meeting to start, Kagan 9 spoke to a board member about whether the board could actually vote to change the mask mandate Tuesday evening. The mitigation strategies are on our agenda as an inform item. Um, it is not an item designated for action tonight, which 
it would need to be an action item in order for us to vote on. Clock hits 620. Parents start walking in without masks, quickly exceeding capacity. Kega 9 walked inside and heard the superintendent say the meeting was canceled. The meeting you never started. We've adjourned the study session. And I'm not okay, so you. what, what I'm you telling you is you're ask, you're being asked to leave. Okay, okay. so okay. what so time please, is the open so, meeting? So, so please leave now. What time does the open meeting start? Please leave. No, no, I'm asking you a question. You're an elected. You work for the people. What time does the meeting start? Protesters did not leave the meeting room until 7 p.m., which is the time a sergeant with the sheriff's department set for them to go. So, okay. Can you give so, us seven minutes? Seven I will give you seven minutes. Okay, thank you. Once they walked out, our crew followed and was met with this. Our children, our children. Eventually, a deputy agrees to escort a parent into the meeting room to negotiate a peaceful end to the rally so that they can leave. I will ask if a small group can go in and maybe we work something out. Even one but we time. cannot That's fine. we cannot be over talking at one time and making a chaos out of That's this. Right. Let's do it orderly. They will follow. Follow. They will. They will. Now here's the caveat. If they say no, we do it another time. Everybody understand? Yes. We cannot do this all night long. The district and the board allowed five students to speak. Each one walked in with a parent. Two board members left, leaving three others and the superintendent to listen to the parents without violating open meeting laws, and media was not allowed in. Ceci Patricia Flores is a mother of two boys, both of whom have disappeared in Mexico, she says, due to organized crime. I would never be able to express the pain I feel. It's an indescribable pain. There are no words. There is no consolation. When her second son disappeared, she founded Madres Buscadoras de Sonora, a group of women who dedicate their lives to search for missing loved ones. A couple days ago, her organization went to Rocky Point to start a search. She says what they have found is horrific. The first day, we found four graves with four burned remains. Yesterday, we found 13 graves with 13 decomposing bodies with identifiable features. And today, she says they discovered 25 more bodies, which would make it a total of 42 bodies found. This is something my colleagues and I will never be able to recover from. While the discoveries bring pain to their hearts, Flores says she is happy to be able to bring a child home to their family. I take comfort in knowing that families are going to be reunited with their loved ones and they will have a proper burial like they deserve. Flores says they are done with the search in the area for now, but that she's going to continue searching for others in hopes that she will find one or both of her sons. Wow, yeah, just tragic. shocking and tragic. Yeah. The goal of the class is to teach your dog to pull away if they spot a snake. Now, at first, it might seem like your dog's misbehaving, but if they suddenly pull in one direction, you're going to want to follow. You don't know they're there. Follow your dog. Paul Blauschild has been training dogs for nearly 50 years. He owns Adobe Dog Training. We want to save your dog. We want to save your pocketbook and then save you too. To help prevent snake bites, Blauschild partnered up with Jeff Carver, a professional snake wrangler and owner of Arizona Animal Experts. We are getting more snake calls than any other time of the year right now. Jeff uses the snakes he catches from homes to train dogs before releasing them out into the wild. Carver says daytime calls for rattlers are at an all-time high. The snake has decided that he wants to self-quarantine under bushes, underneath that patio furniture. So the duo works together, one handling the rattlesnakes, the other training dogs through the five stations. So the first one, we use a rattlesnake proxy, looks pretty real, sitting on rags that are kept with the live snakes. So it's a scent station. Then we'll move on to the second station with a live snake that will be rattling and that we refer to as a sound station. Here you'll notice the snake is muzzled. That's for the safety of both the dog and their owner. So then we'll move to a third station, which has a snake that has taped up the rattles. A wet rattle makes no noise. We want the dog to visually see it and stay away. Fourth station is also for scent. Then the last station really tests the dog's ability to learn and retain. The fifth station is where we somewhat chase the dog away, bringing a snake straight up to him. Blauschild says positive affirmation is a must through the training. Good boy. The dog is also given low level shocks. We want him to be scared thinking the snake has done that to him. The result, when your dog sees or smells a snake, they'll switch sides on you suddenly. The other signal is that they'll just put the brakes on and they don't want to go any further. And if you're out walking, remember, while snakes can strike roughly two thirds their body length, they want to be left alone. That's what the rattle is about. It's not to be menacing. It's not anything other than, hey, I'm here, leave me alone.
Good news is Kovu passed with an A minus. For more information on how you can get your dog trained, visit our website, kagan9.com. Reporting from the east side, Lustelia and Kovu Caballero, Kagan9 on your side.